Hi, my name is Loïc Royer. I am a group leader at the Chan Security Biohub. Today, I will lay out the basics on how to store, process, and visualize n-dimensional microscopy datasets. This presentation is part of the image analysis course. So microscopy starts at the microscope by acquiring the image data on a camera or detector. This data is then stored and processed on the computer. And finally, the data can be visualized on the screen. Until recently, most microscopy data, as you can see here, was two-dimensional or had limited depth. Nowadays, more and more microscope designs and modalities produce three-dimensional data sets that are extending across time and other dimensions, thus producing multi-dimensional data. A three-dimensional image is often called a stack. Images with more dimensions are also often called stacks. A stack is made of voxels in the same way that a two-dimensional image is made of pixels. Each voxel is assigned a fractional or integer value. These values can be represented with different levels of precision, such as 8, 16, 32, or 64 bits. But typically, we don't just acquire a single image. In the case of live imaging, you typically acquire time lapses consisting of multiple stacks obtained at regular intervals. You can also acquire multiple channels that might represent different imaging wavelengths or imaging modalities, such as different fluorescent labels, different label-free modalities, etc. Throughout this presentation, I will use a running example, a 21-hour time-lapse recording of a developing Drosophila embryo. What you see here are the histones labeled with red fluorescent protein. The acquisition was done on a light sheet microscope uh, with 30 second intervals uh, for a total of 2,500 time points. The raw data before processing is a total of 2 terabytes. Such data sets pose a number of challenges in terms of storage, processing, and visualization. Some of these challenges are specific to their multidimensional nature. At the end of this lecture, you will have a better understanding of how to store, process, and visualize such data sets. Attached to this video, we will provide all references and links to the tools mentioned and used in this presentation, as well as alternatives and complementary software. First, let's examine the key concepts and challenges that arise when storage search data. In this plot, we have the storage capacity on the y-axis and storage speed on the x-axis for different acquisition or storage devices. For example, you can see that hard disk can typically store 2 terabytes at a speed of 100 megabytes per second. The Drosophila time-lapse that I showed you before is 2 terabytes of raw data and is acquired on a microscope that can output 2 gigabytes per second. Faster microscopes exist that can out output up to 4 gigabytes per second and produce up to 50 terabytes of data on a single run. The take-home message here is that modern microscopes produce very large amounts of data that pose serious data management challenges. Let's first review some basic concepts on how to store images. When storing such data sets, an, an important consideration is how to decide on the unit of storage. For example, each time point is typically stored as one unit that is materialized as a single file. However, if you attempt to access the value of a single voxel across time, you're often forced to load the entire stack of each time point. This is highly inefficient. To address this, a common strategy consists in partitioning the data set into smaller storage units called chunks. Ideally, the partitioning happens along all dimensions, thus facilitating localized access. Now you can access the individual voxels by loading the relevant chunks without having to load the entire stack. Oftentimes, one needs to process or visualize the data at a lower level of detail. Therefore, it is inefficient to have to load every single voxel of a stack. In order to have rapid access to coarser representations of the data, it is often convenient to store downscale versions of the image along with the full resolution data. Such representations are called image pyramids. The additional data that you need to be to be stored is quite limited. For example, if we store two lower resolution versions of the data by downscaling by a factor two along every dimension, only 14% extra data needs to be stored. 
In some cases, it can be advantageous to have chunks of diff different dimensions within a single stack. This affords the opportunity to adapt the storage to the information content present in different image regions. This can be useful when representing very large stacks that are otherwise difficult to store, process, or visualize. Now, we are considering images with potentially several dimensions. But at the end, most storage devices, such as computer memory or hard drives, can only hold data along a single dimension. Therefore, we need a strategy to linearize a multidimensional data set into a single sequence of numbers. A typical approach is to first list the values along the x dimension and then along the y dimension and so on for all dimensions. In this case, voxel values that are close along the x and y axis are also in proximity when linearized. For example, here, pixels 6 and 7 are neighbors along the x axis and are also neighbors after linearization. Another possibility is to order the voxels along first the z axis and then the y axis and finally the x axis. In that case, pixels 6 and 7 are also neighbors along the z axis. Proximity of voxels in computer memory or on storage devices has profound consequences and is critical for access speed when writing, reading, and processing image data. So this is very important and really helps accessing the data in an efficient manner. Another way to mitigate the large amount of data produced by modern microscopes is data compression. And this has become increasingly important. Once chunks of the data have been linearized, compression algorithms, algorithms can be used to reduce their size. Lossless compression algorithms, such as ZEEP, have the advantage that they do not destroy information and are perfectly reversible. However, they are limited and rarely achieve compression factors above 4 on image data. Lossy compression algorithms can achieve much higher compression ratios, up to factor 100 at times, but they must necessarily discard information to achieve such high levels of compression. Another important consideration is that of compression speed. Some algorithms might achieve high compression ratios without discarding too much information, but they may be prohibitively slow. The computer that controls the microscope rarely has the storage capacity to store the acquired data long term. Eventually, the data needs to be transferred to local storage or to the cloud. Cloud storage has advantage that it is often well maintained, comes with features such as backups and 24-hour support and is for all practical purposes unlimited in capacity. Yet, it has a cost. That can be quite significant. In contrast, local storage has the advantage of easy access, usage flexibility, and high-speed data transfers. But it requires maintenance, expertise, and it's necessarily limited in capacity. So we have seen how to store the data. Now the question is how to process it. And what are the challenges and solutions around multidimensional image processing. So once acquired and stored, the data typically needs to be processed. This can be done on a single machine or on a cluster of machines. These machines can be local or in the cloud. Transmission speed and ease of access of the data are key considerations here. So what are the typical processing steps of these 3D, 4D, and multidimensional data sets. So first, you have to denoise the data. Then you have to correct for the background. And then you have to deconvolve, typically, the data. Other possible subsequent steps are, for example, stitching and fusing the images together. Some of these processing steps fundamentally require to take into account the multidimensional nature of the data. For example, 3D deconvolution typically requires knowing the 3 structure of the point spread function to reduce blur and other focal light. Another issue in 3D volumetric imaging is that of the anisotropic nature of acquired 3D images. Most microscopes acquire the data plane by plane. Unfortunately, it's not practical to have as many planes as we have pixels on a single 2D image. 
And so while the logical layout of pixels is as shown here, the true shape of a voxel in truth is elongated along the z-axis, so it's more like a brick. Recently, methods that utilize machine learning and deep learning in particular have been developed that can turn anisotropic acquisitions into isotropic stacks. As you can see here, the resolution along the axial dimension, the z-axis, is initially quite poor, but can be improved giving an isotropic stack. In general, deep learning is becoming an attractive approach for processing multidimensional data sets. First, because of the results are oftentimes impressive, but also because deep learning leverages specialized computing hardware that makes these algorithms quite efficient. Indeed, in all of these examples mentioned previously, image processing and computation around a single voxel requires to consider a large number of neighboring voxels. Already, when considering only adjacent voxels, the more dimensions, the more voxels need to be considered. This leads to a rapid explosion of the computational requirements. For example, in four dimensions, a single voxel has eight direct neighbors and a total of 80 neighbors when including diagonal neighbors. And this is only for the most direct neighbors surrounding that voxel. Well, in the past, most image processing, uh, processing was done on the central processing units of computers. Today, the processing is shifting to graphical processing units. These GPUs are designed to operate on a race of voxels in parallel and are thus oftentimes 100 times faster than CPUs for image processing. Okay, so we have seen how to store, how to process these data sets. Now let's look at how to visualize this data. So one simple approach is to visualize on the screen each 2D plane for different time points and channels. Here we show a selection of six planes across 3D stack of our Drosophila embryo dataset. We can also display these slices over time as a movie, or project all the slices by taking the maximal value for voxel along, along the z direction. However, a lot of details from the dorsal and ventral side of the embryo get projected together into a single 2D image, leading to confusion. Instead, a better idea is to project only half of the stack at a time into two distinct ventral and dorsal projections. Another possibility is to project and color code the depth of the visible pixels to convey depth explicitly. However, color is oftentimes a poor conveyor of depth. Yet another approach is to simultaneously and interactively visualize three orthogonal slices, x, y, x, z, and y, z, and all of that intersecting around a single point. We have just seen very simple schemes to visualize a three-dimensional data set into a 2D screen. These schemes are unsatisfactory as they don't convey the true three-dimensional nature of the data. Creating 2D images from multidimensional data is often called rendering. There are mainly two classical approaches for rendering 3D data, volume rendering and surface rendering, as you can see here. In the following, I will focus on volume rendering as it, as, as it is oftentimes the most appropriate for light microscopy data. A typical technique for volume rendering is that of ray casting. Rays are drawn from the eye to each pixel on the screen and continue traversing the whole three-dimensional array of voxels. For each such ray, we collect the voxel's values along the ray and then decide on which intensity to display on the screen for that pixel. The typical approach simply collects the maximal value along the ray. More sophisticated schemes that model attenuation, color, and lighting give more informative and pleasing results. Here's, for example, what you get if you collect the maximal voxel intensity along each ray. The problem is that you also see what is at the back of the embryo, making the rendering again confusing. We need something better. Let's consider an example. Here, the maximal projection would return a value coming from the back of the visualized sample, despite the fact that there's a lot of structure to show at the front of it. 
one simple solution is to model the attenuation as, a pro as proportional to the signal itself. Now, intensity values are attenuated as they traverse the sample. The maximal voxel value is not at the back of the sample anymore, but at the front, because there is less attenuation for structures at the front than at the back. Here is the result of rendering with max projection and attenuation. Structures on the surface are easier to discern. We can also slice the 3D image to see the interior. Time lapses can also be visualized and combined with rotation. Here you can see two views that are 180 degrees relative to each other with time lapse playback. We can also combine all of these aspects together, rotating and slicing the data set while playing back the time lapse. To be of practical use, volume rendering needs to be fast and fluid, especially during interactive visualization. And so we need some tricks to be able to do that fast. So here I'm going to show you one. So the standard approach for volume rendering is simply to go through every voxel along the way, one by one, and collect all the information that needs to be collected. Uh, the problem is that's oftentimes too slow and, and not efficient. A better approach is to have a multi-pass rendering algorithm where you do multiple passes collecting a fraction of the information and progressively you refine the image. And so the next thing to do is then to maybe skip every, uh, to, to only collect the information every four voxels as, as shown here. And you did once and then again and again and again. And, and so while you rotate your sample, you only show a fourth of the information in some sense. Uh, and then when you stop rotating, stop interacting with your data set, you can then refine and then complete the image to have a full image quality rendering, right? So that's a successive approach. But we need something smarter because the problem is that if you look at it, there's big holes in the sampling pattern for a long time. So better strategy uh, is, is something that we called uh, uh, Fibonacci rendering. And the idea there is to basically shift the pattern in, in an optimal way. And we use the mathematical properties of the Fibonacci sequence and uh, uh, the golden ratio to achieve that. So let's look, look at how it looks like. So instead of collecting the samples uh, uh, next to the previous ones and, and thus keeping really big holes in the sampling pattern for a long time, we simply uh, uh, jump ahead and try to collect information from the middle point or a little bit before, a bit beyond that. And we repeat that every time by somehow keeping the holes in the sampling pattern as small as possible, as soon as possible. And so this technique, as you can see here, is, it leads to, to, to essentially a lesser perception of, 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 of blinking or flashing. As you can see here, the naive approach is, it's very slow, so it takes a long time to get the image, so it's not going to be interactive. But in the case of the Fibonacci approach, the image, uh, after a few passes, the image is already of quite good quality. Here is how it looks like in practice. This is a very large multi-channel image of neurons within the Drosophila brain. As you can see, interaction is fluid, and quality recovers as soon as the movement is stopped. The multi-pass algorithm is active during interaction. And when we stop interacting with the volume, the image is refined and finally displayed at its full, full quality. In conclusion, modern microscopy produces large multi-dimensional datasets that pose novel challenges for storage, processing, and visualization. I hope that this presentation has given you the, a basic understanding of the concepts and challenges posed by modern multidimensional microscopy data. Thank you very much.